Michael Hoon began a career in aviation when he became an apprentice mechanic for Norman Brearley at the Langley Park Airstrip in 1923. He went on to become the chief engineer for McRobertson Miller Aviation. After 55 years in engineering, he was seconded to the Department of Foreign Affairs as aviation technical advisor to such Asian nations as Nepal, Malaysia and India. Finally retiring in 1978, he was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1997. He was a keen photographer and recorded much of the growth of aviation in Western Australia. This is a video display of some of his photographs at the Maylands Historical Society in 2021, with a short prehistory of aviation before Frank's career. <laughs> The world's first heavier than air flight was made by Lawrence Hargrave at Stanwell Park, south of Sydney. The area is well known for its favourable gliding winds and on the morning of 12th of November 1894, Hargrave launched a series of four box kites off the town beach and then climbed into a seat attached to the lowest kite. A strong gust propelled him into the air, but because of their box design, the kites remained steady in the buffeting winds. The box kite design influenced world aviation for the next four decades. On December the 17th, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright made four brief flights at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina with their first powered aircraft. The Wright brothers had invented the powered aeroplane and it was based on the box kites experimented with by Lawrence Hargrave. The first aircraft to fly in Western Australia was a Bristol box kite, one of two brought to Australia by the British and Colonial Company. Joseph Hammond gave a public demonstration at Belmont Park Racecourse on the 3rd of January 1911, just over seven years after the Wright brothers made their first flight. The Kalgoorlie was built and financed in that gold mining town by a group of mining school students. They were joined by Jack Gere, who was WA's only licensed pilot at the time. He was a British pilot who had wound up in the gold fields, despite several accidents, including this one in June 1915, this plane finally flew to Perth in late 1915. Major Sir Norman Brearley survived World War I as a decorated pilot in the RAF and saw a commercial future for aviation. Within two years, he went from novelty flying days at Belmont Park and the WACA with his Avros to form the first commercial airline in WA. He won the mail contract for the North West. Belmont Racecourse at 1pm, the 2nd of December, 1920. On board were businessman Clement J. De Garris, his personal pilot F.S. Frank Briggs and mechanic O.J. Jack Howard. At the new airstrip on Langley Park, apprentice Dave Cahoon, about to prime the engine of one of the five Bristol tourers, which really imported to begin his mail runs. West Australian Airways pilots at Langley Park 1921. Left to right, Kingsford Smith, Bob Fawcett, Norman Brearley, Ten Taplin and Val Abbott. Assorted dignitaries also gathered for photo ops. This Bristol tourer had the shortest life in service. One day, leaving Geraldton on the 5th of December 1921, it crashed one hour later killing the pilot Bob Fawcett and his mechanic Ted Broad. The aircraft is pictured here on Langley Park at the foot of Hill Street, Perth. When Maylands Aerodrome opened in 1924, flying activity was restricted to two operators, West Australian Airways and Mr A.G. Simpson, a wealthy middle-aged amateur with a great interest in aviation as an early private operator. 
The original hangar on Langley Park was moved to the new aerodrome at Maylands. Brearley's Bristol Tourers now made that their home, shortly after a water tower was added to the infrastructure. In 1926, the rest house was added for arriving and departing passengers and was the beginning of the long road to the air terminals we know today. Mechanics would gather at Critchley's garage in Inglewood each morning. They were then transported to the Maylands Aerodrome in this Ford T truck driven by Dave Colhoun. In spite of its crude appearance, the Bristol Tourer was a remarkably robust aircraft as they were designed from a World War I fighter, the Bristol F-2B. Since the mail contract was the major reason for West Australian Airways' existence, the official PMG van was a regular visitor to the aerodrome. Airways' new hangar, the original one is, is still there with the water tower between them. The first Hercules, G-A-U-J-O, is on the tarmac with the second machine, G-A-U-J-P, in the new hangar built to house them. Father Christmas and the Bear arrive at Maylands in 1925 as part of what became a regular annual promotion by Bowen's department store. Norman Brearley wrote, Only once did water compel WA Airways to move from Maylands and then only briefly. In 1926, the Swan River was in record flood. We watched the levees crumble and the river water gush across the ground. The hangar floor was soon submerged. We all stumped about in the water, hauling engines and tools onto benches and platforms. Luckily, most of the aircraft were out on the mail route. Those in the hangar had their tails lifted high, leaving only their undercarriages to stand in the water. Frank Colhoun, minus trousers, feeling his way over the door rails of the WA Airways hangar during the flood. The landing ground and the buildings were all flooded. They called themselves the propellant crew and they worked clearing the field of water, sewage and dead animals. Left to right, Jock Barclay, Bill Bland, George Wilson, Molly Sage, Jack Hopkins, George Leach and Frank Colhoun. A DH-50 at the hastily arranged Horton's Vineyard, Upper Swan Airstrip. The last of three DH-50 aircraft built entirely at Maylands by airline staff from drawings supplied by de Havilland in 1927. Horry Miller talking with Sir McPherson Robinson, the confectionery tycoon at Maylands. Robinson gave financial backing to Miller to start his airline and McRobertson Miller Airline was the result. The Fokker 7 3M Southern Cross GAUSU of Sir Charles Kingsford Smith with the tiny Anik 1 of George Simpson under its wing in 1928. The first Perth Adelaide Air Service was begun in 1929 by West Australian Airways using triple engine de Havilland Hercules aircraft. One of these planes is here seen taking off from Maylands. 1928 Parafield, South Australia. The DH-61 aircraft, Old Gold, G-A-U-T-L, owned by the Commercial Aviation Company and sold to WA Airways in 1931. Stabled with the aircraft at Maylands, this Norman Brearley owned speedboat had a Sidley Puma engine fitted. Brearley had Frank and Dave Cahoon man the boat in races. Breaking down in most races, it only finished once. That was the only race it won. Planes lined up for the 1920 Centenary Air Race to Melbourne. Two views of South Bank Road, running down to the aerodrome from Johnson Road. Shown here with puddles all around, this DH-61 Giant Moth was one of the two operated by WA Airways. It carried six passengers and was used on the northwest service when traffic increased. Hans Bertram's Junkers W33 at Maylands Aerodrome, after removal of the floats and fitting of wheels prior to its departure for Melbourne in October 1932, 
This plane had made a forced landing in the Kimberleys and Bertram had spent three months living with Indigenous people before he and his aircraft were found. The infamous biplane, designed and built by Edward Galway in 1932, using the principle of the variable incidence wing. No one would fly it and Galway, who was not a licensed pilot, flew it himself and crashed to his death near Armidale. West Australian Airways DH-50 float plane, Riverside at Maylands in 1932. Floats and wheels were interchangeable, increasing the takeoff and landing spaces. In 1933, a Viastra, an unreliable twin-engine British monoplane, had an engine failure, and due to a lack of spare engines, it had a geared-up Jupiter engine on one side and a direct-drive Jupiter on the other. This DH-50 lost one wheel on takeoff from Maylands and then lost the other on landing back at the airfield. It finally nosed over. Jimmy Woods, the Scotsman, turned West Aussie, who took part on the London to Melbourne Air Race and later ran his own airline on the Maylands to Rottnest route. The first DH-84 Dragons outside the MMA hangar at Maylands Aerodrome awaiting the start of the company's Northwest service in 1934. By the mid-1930s, air travel had become reliable and regular, so timetables began to be printed. The new McRobertson Miller Aviation Hangar at Maylands. After the war, this hangar was dismantled and then re-erected at the new Guildford Airport. Horry Miller's Lockheed Vega at Maylands after repairs to damage sustained on landing at Lipo in Greece during the centenary air race of October 1934. It was from Milden Hall in Wiltshire to Flemington Racecourse in Melbourne. <laughs> An aerial view of the brickworks and the aerodrome probably taken just pre-World War II. Father Christmas was still flying into Perth for the Bones Toyland Christmas promotions. Here it is being lifted out of the Swan River at the Barrack Street jetty prior to its journey through the streets of the Perth CBD to the Bones store in Murray Street. ST25 Monospa VHUVJ outside the MMA hangar shortly after assembly for Airlines WA Limited. The DC 2 was a 14 seat twin engined airliner manufactured from 1934 to 1939. This DC 2, the Mungara, was operated by Australian National Airlines. MMA's second DH 86A VHUSD Brisbane damaged in a ground loop on the Derby airfield. Left to right, Cole Brown, Alex Whittam, Bill Bland and Jack Hopkins in 1938. MMA DH86A RMA Canberra VHUSC at Maylands in 1938. The airline's WA-owned Stinson, SR-7B Reliant, VH-UTW, landing at Maylands Aerodrome, July 1939. Lockheed 10A Electra, VH-ABW Kimberley, undergoing maintenance. Engineers, from left to right, Howard Emerson, George Allen, Dave John, and Frank Colquhoun. Refueling the Douglas DC-2 Lungana at Maylands Aerodrome in 1939. A Tiger Moth about to land at Maylands Aerodrome. One of the two MMA de Havilland DH-86 airliners at Maylands. It was impressed into the Royal Australian Air Force as an ambulance aircraft in 1940.
a flight of RAF Wapitis at Maylands in the early 1930s. The RAF made a number of recruiting visits to Maylands, looking to find potential pilots among the colonials. The size of the aerodrome is clearly shown in this RAAF information sheet. The longest possible runway was just 1,000 yards, or 914 metres. This increasingly became a problem as the war continued. Between 1939 and 1945, commercial flying continued, but private flying ceased at Maylands. The Royal Aero Club's training service was transferred to the RAAF flying schools at Cunderton and Geraldton, while Maylands provided major repairs and services in a large hangar erected by the Department of Aircraft Production. Maylands was off-limits to the public and a pass was required by workers to gain entry. Soon after the start of the Pacific War, many foreign aircraft staged through Maylands, which became a temporary home to P-40 Warhawk or Kitty Hawk fighters, which were flown from Queensland and towed to Fremantle at night to be loaded onto a United States aircraft tender. A Warhawk undergoing maintenance at Maylands. A B-17 flying fortress on the runway at Maylands. They arrived and departed, testing the size of the airfield to its limit. An American B-24 Liberator bomber on the apron at Maylands with a B-17 flying fortress behind. The United States Navy at Crawley utilised the fabric doping shop at Maylands for repairs they could not undertake at their own base. Many women were employed on the aerodrome to carry out important maintenance tasks on a wide range of RAAF and Allied aircraft throughout the war. While Maylands made a considerable contribution to the war effort, its restricted takeoff length served to make clear the need for a larger airport. The Dunreef Golf Course at Guildford was chosen as the site for that new aerodrome. By 1946, most operators who used sophisticated aircraft had moved to Guildford, Dunreef, Aerodrome. October 1947, the MMA DC-3 VHAXM Fitzroy was used for the charter flight to India to pick up the Indian Test Cricket Team to play in Australia. The DC-3 Fitzroy is shown standing on a steel panelled parking area at Kalang Airport. The crew were C. Kleinig Captain, A. Bud First Officer and F. Colhoun Chief Engineer. The Maylands Infrastructure in 1947 MMA Avro Anson VHAYO used post-war for flying doctor work and feeder services. Sadly, on the 2nd of July 1949, the Fitzroy, which had gone to India, crashed into a housing commission camp in South Guildford within a mile of takeoff from Guildford Airport. All 18 people on board were killed. This was the worst air disaster in Western Australia until the loss of the Viscount near Port Hedland in 1968 when 26 people died. MMA air hostesses, Joan Stonehouse, Joyce Vale and Hilary Johnson. 1950, the radio servicing team employed by AWA Aviation Service. Although based at Perth Airport, they regularly serviced and installed equipment at Maylands. The founding president of the Maylands Historical and Peninsula Association, Frank Greenslade, is on the far right. An interior view of a DC-3 filled with passengers for this posed publicity photo. A tiger moth over the causeway in 1956 with Reg Currell at the controls. MMA staff looking happy on the new boarding staircase. 1953 Drysdale River Mission, Lockheed 10A Electra, VHMMD on a visit to the mission. Captain Jack Murray on the left and Flight Officer Jack Dixon on the right with local people. 1955. The combined staff of MMA and Airlines WA Limited held at the Odd Fellows building on the occasion of the enforced merger of the two companies by the Department of Civil Aviation. One half of the MMA fleet of DC-3s at Perth Airport. Perth Airport, 
Lockheed 10A Electra VH-ABV and an MMA DC-3 in the background. The first memorial to the Maylands Aerodrome was a row of leftover approach lights along Clarkson Road. After a 14-year campaign by the Maylands Historical and Peninsular Association, the City of Bayswater erected a memorial to the Aerodrome. Lisa Baker, MP, and Maylands Historical and Peninsular Association President Terry Gaunt, with the model for the memorial in 2012, a 2021 view of the memorial. And so, after four decades of noise and excitement, tragedy and triumph, this part of Maylands fell quiet. Although there are those who say that in the peace of the evening, standing looking at the memorial, the faint sound of a Bristol tourer coming into land against a sea breeze can sometimes be heard overhead. Thank you.